suppose that what attracted me to join EHKU Law is, first of all, the fact that it is a highly reputed institution in terms of teaching and research. The second thing is that I wanted to remain in Hong Kong for a bit longer, and HKU seemed like the perfect place to do that sort of thing. The idea is also that in HKU there are more persons that deal with topics that are close to what I do in terms of my research, and that also was a powerful reason to come here. I suppose that, practically speaking also, HKU, because of its size and because of the way that it has been um, doing its academic and, and teaching related activities, there is a lot more flexibility in terms of uh, organizing one's time when it comes to allocating teaching, for example, uh, and also, of course, as a result, dedicating time to research. Well, that, that is going back more than 10 years. I suppose that I did my undergraduate law degree at the University of Milan, so I was born as a civil lawyer, not as a common lawyer. But then, as soon as I had finished my uh, degree in Milan, I started off uh, as a master's student, and then immediately after a PhD at Cambridge. And I was very, very fortunate when I was there to have some very, very good research mentors. Now, um, Amongst those ones, I will count the late uh, Sir, James, uh, Sir James, the late James Crawford, the judge of the International Court of Justice, and then uh, my PhD supervisor, who was Professor Christine Gray. So Professor Gray, she wasn't someone that worked in the same area as I did because I was working on a PhD in law of the sea, whereas she is recognized as an expert primarily, I would say, in the law of the use of force and international humanitarian law. Though, to be honest, in her research, she also did a fair bit of international dispute settlement. So suppose that that is my original background. Then after that, I went on to uh, work as an associate legal officer at the International Court of Justice. Now, that is a very different situation, a very different environment in the sense that it is not a university anymore, it's an international institution with all the good and the bad that an institution brings with itself. The administration, for example, is the bad, what I don't really like. Uh, but the good thing about the ICJ was that a lot of the people that were working there were very interested in the academic side of international law. And I think that there was an eye to the developments that were happening in the scholarship and also um, in, well, it was the scholarship across international institutions and, uh, in, and university institutions as well. A lot of my colleagues, for example, would have PhDs themselves. The majority of us I actually think did have PhDs. Several judges also were educated to PhD level. Those that weren't were diplomats uh, or judges in domestic legal systems. So it was a very dynamic environment in that sense, very intellectually challenging. The one thing that also made it interesting was that the ICJ was a small environment. So pretty much everyone knew everyone else. So there was a lot of opportunity of uh, for discussion, for conversation, on topics of international law, of course. It was, <laughs> in a way, it was an international law, uh, n an international law nerd's dream, if you wish. It was very much that sort of thing. And then after that, I moved on to Hong Kong because that, uh, after the ICJ, I took up my very first academic position at the City University of Hong Kong for three years before I moved to HKU. My experience at HKU so far has been very positive. I have liked the colleagues that I found. I have found very reasonable persons when it comes to administration. And most of all, one of the things that really made the difference, I think, is that the leadership team that we have at HKU and the ones that I have been in contact with so far, they have been extremely supportive of young scholars, I would say, but I would say in general, they're being supportive of people with good ideas. And I'm not referring just to my ideas, I'm referring to conversations that I've had also with other colleagues who have received or are receiving support from the faculty. That is extremely important. And one thing that sometimes I feel we don't really, we don't really put, we don't really stress enough 
in the context of an academic institution. We're all sometimes too focused on criticizing each other for better or for, for, for the better, I mean, because of course the whole idea of academic endeavor is that you would have someone criticizing your ideas so that you can get them, you can form them better, can argue better. But sometimes we forget that having support from those that are also senior to you is extremely important uh, in an academic institution. So I'm teaching both in the LLB and in the JD. I do not teach on the LLM at the moment. So I, I see some of the undergraduate students and some of the postgraduate students. And I would say that in general, I find the level to be very high. I um, suppose that I saw a difference with students that I was in contact with uh, in the years before I moved to HKU. And I don't mean City University, I mean in general uh, also other universities in which I might have guest lectured and so on. Uh, I can see a different approach by students here in HKU. One of the things that really struck me was that uh, yes, I would be teaching cases, for example, to my students. Uh, many times what students do is that they take what you give them and they do not really question it too much or at least if they question it, they don't tell you that they do. But here in HKU, I actually found students coming back to me the week after, for example, the a contra law lecture, and they told me, well, you said A and B in the lecture, but I read the case that you refer to, and the case says Y and Z. Could you explain that to me, please? And sometimes it is the student that maybe um, has not caught the nuance in, in the case, for instance. Uh, sometimes it's actually the student pointing out to an alternative reading of a particular case, which in a way, if you are a teacher, keeps you on your toes. And I think it's very valuable to, to keep being a good teacher. Well, because I do not teach on the HKU LLM, I'm not, in, and I don't do selections for that, I'm not entirely sure what to say to those that want to apply for an LLM in HKU, so probably shouldn't say anything about that. <laughs> in general, let's say that for uh, LLMs uh, throughout the world, there are two things that I would say, probably. One is that you need to have a very high GPA. I am sorry to say that because I know how much students, especially in Hong Kong and, and a East Asia in general, they're so focused on getting the A, nothing else will do. But the reality is that when you apply for a master's degree in the UK, for example, which is my experience, or in the US, which isn't my experience, but I know people that have done so, the really the one thing that determines whether you get in or not is whether you meet the GPA that they want. And if you don't, that can be a bit of a problem. So that's the first point I will make. The second piece of advice that I would give is that a master's degree is an investment, both in terms of time and in terms of money. And I suppose also there's a third point, uh, which is also uh, that it is an investment in terms of your future career. So if I were to commit money, time, and effort to a master's program, I would make sure that I choose the master's program in the best universities out there. I wouldn't go just to any university because they offer a master's program and they offer me a place on it. I would rather take a year out, for example, and do the PCLL or practice for a little bit, for example, so as to get my profile more interesting for an LLM program over rushing it and walking into something which probably at the end of the day is not going to be as worth as much worth as a peer, as a LLM in a different, better institution. Well, I suppose that I only taught in HKU for one term, so I cannot really say that I ha have had many ve very interesting experiences just yet. I would probably go back to what I said earlier on, which is that students do keep me on my toes and I do enjoy that because I think it does make me a better teacher, hopefully. <laughs> we, we will see. Maybe over the years I will be able to accumulate a few more experiences, but at the moment I cannot really point to any specific ones, I would say.
I find this question always a bit difficult because when I self-identify as a general international lawyer, it's also a bit difficult to say I work on research area A, B, and C, in the sense that you work on anything really that takes your fancy. You just see something passing by, it looks interesting, and you think, well, why, why not do that for a while? And so I suppose that that is really <laughs> the way that I go about doing my research. Probably if I had to point to certain areas that I have published in in the past, and that probably is what this question really is about, they would be mostly uh, th three areas, the law of the sea, international dispute settlement and sources of international law. So these are the three main areas I would say. I, w I started in the law of the sea because that is what my early publications and what my PhD was about. But then because I was interested in working, well because I worked at the ICJ, then of course I took an interest in international dispute settlement, especially on the interstate side of things. So I cannot really say that I have done a lot of work, for example, on investor state disputes or on uh, dispute settlement in the context of human rights, but I've, I've touch, touched on those topics tangentially, perhaps more than anything else, I would say. And then my latest research interest, my latest focus would be on the so sources of international law. That's what my current efforts are being directed at, I would say. So uh, by sources, I sure I'm interested in treaty general principles, but mainly my research at the moment is on the identification and formation of customer international law. I see something, it looks interesting, I read as much as I can about it, and then I see if there is anything meaningful or potentially meaningful that I could write on it. So I guess that the real reason why I conduct research in this field is because I find it interesting, and I find that it gives me joy to an extent. Once actually uh, talking to a friend, uh, they said that they don't like doing research, they like having done research, which is, you know, having finished what you're, what you're doing, which I suppose is correct in the sense that the process can be a bit daunting and difficult at the beginning, including the choice of a topic. But it is something that at the end of the process gives me that satisfaction that makes it worth it. The biggest challenge in my research is uh, definitely the, let me rephrase that. The biggest challenge that I find in my research is to finesse an argument that I have already put black on white. I think it's, for me, it's relatively easy to find a topic that could be an argument, that could give me an argument to develop in a paper, for example, or in a, in a longer work. The problem is that sometimes the argument is or looks half-baked. So it, it is, n it is qu nearly there, but not entirely there. Sometimes it needs to be narrowed down a bit more. Sometimes it needs to be slightly more ambitious. Sometimes it needs to be a bit wider in scope, for example, because it, must enco it should encompass another area that I haven't looked at, for example, uh, another international court or tribunal that I haven't actually been looking at in the written piece so far. So that is the one thing that I find most difficult. And to be honest, the one thing that if I have a piece which is not accepted for publication, that is a lot of the time the reason why it is not being accepted, because the argument is nearly there but not just yet. So a good friend of mine once told me that we have finished, we have exhausted the problems to write about in international law. We have written about everything that could be written. And to an extent, I think that that is a fair assessment because there's only so many things that we can write about. But the reality is that there are always new ways of looking at those things and always new, um, new rules coming into existence, new perspectives that may come from 
the technological advances that we've had in the last few years or global challenges such as global warming and climate change and the resulting sea level rise, for instance. So there are, there are old problems in a way, or better, there are old research areas, but there are new problems to look into those areas. So to look at the three research areas that I've been looking at, Lower the Sea, I suppose that the main most exciting developments at the moment would relate to everything that has to do with uh, climate change caused sea level rise and uh, the change in the shape of the coastline and the resulting consequences, implications for maritime boundaries, for example, or uh, for the rights and duties of states in relation to fishing, hydrocarbon explorations in the exclusive economic zone on the continental shelf. And the other big thing in Lower the Sea at the moment is the newly adopted uh, BB&J agreement. So the agreement concerning areas beyond national jurisdiction has been in the making for many, many years. And we're now awaiting the ratification process that would eventually uh, come, get the agreement to come into force. When it comes to international dispute settlement, I suppose there are a number of things that one could say are exciting at the moment. I will only say, uh, tell you about one of these things because it's one of the, the areas that I'm working on at the moment. There's a project that I started with the support of HKU Faculty of Law, in fact, uh, which concerns standards of review in international dispute settlement. So the idea that sometimes because of the vagueness of certain particular rules of international to be applied in order to decide if a state has breached an obligation, we have to consider whether, or international courts and tribunals actually, have to consider whether a um, particular conduct by a state is reasonable or whether the state's action has been proportionate, if the state has conducted itself with due diligence. And I suppose that these are very vague standards uh, that need to be applied in very real cases and there is a lot of literature recently and as I said this research project that I started uh, here in HKU that looks at trying to understand to um, nail down exactly what these standards mean and how they can be applied in real life cases. There has been a lot of literature on this in the last couple of years, well 10 years probably. Uh, edited collections being written about the role of deference in the context of international dispute settlement. The one research project that I'm doing at the moment here in HKU is um, going to end up, result hopefully, in, a, in an edited collection of, of essays mostly written by early and mid-career scholars that each of, each of whom is going to look into a different standard or method of review. So we have the person that looks into reasonableness, one person that looks into due diligence and so on and so forth. And uh, the idea is to, appro to approach this topic from a comparative perspective. And by comparative I don't mean different domestic legal system, systems, I mean uh, different inter international courts and tribunals. So trying to bring together how different international courts and tribunals approach what we look at being the same standard of review. So for example, reasonableness. And the last area uh, that I mentioned earlier on is the one of sources of international law. Now there is a lot of exciting stuff happening in relation to sources at the moment. We have a uh, study of the International Law Commission on General Principles of International Law. In fact, one of my colleagues here at HKU, Professor Alex Stone Sweet, is someone that has worked quite intensely on general principles in the last few years. And then um, we also have a, a new school of thought that has been uh, going on for the past 10 years that looks into the interpretability uh, of customary rules of international law. A topic on which I have to be honest, I'm, I'm slightly skeptical. I have written on the uh, difficulty that there are in accepting the analytical feasibility of interpreting rules of customer international law. Um, but one of the greatest things I have to say that I've seen happen in the last few years to, to myself actually, is that even though I have a very different view from those that are trying to argue for the interpretability of customer international law, some of the persons that I had the most fruitful conversations about this topic with were exactly those that believe that one can interpret customary rules of international law. So I really enjoyed this uh, academic exchange that I had with uh, these colleagues and friends, even though we stand on very different sides of the barricade, so to speak.
So I suppose I, I could touch on two articles, perhaps. One which is forthcoming, and another one that is instead something that I have been working on and it is not yet forthcoming. So the forthcoming one would be uh, an article that um, is due to appear on the Modern Law Review concerning the English Foreign Act of State Doctrine. And the other one is an article instead that I'm working on concerning the approach of international courts and tribunals to selecting evidence of uh, state practice and opinion juris to identify rules of customer international law. So starting with the first one, the one of the English Foreign Act of State Doctrine, that is an article that uh, stemmed from the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom's judgment of 2021 in the so-called Venezuelan gold case. The idea uh, is that there are these gold reserves for nearly $2 billion in the Bank of England um, they belong to the government of Venezuela, but at the moment nobody really knows which side of, which government of Venezuela, given that we have two competing claimants to be the government of the country, can access these resources in the Bank of England. And there was a case that went all the way up to the Supreme Court of the UK that had to do exactly with this question. And one of the main questions that came up for the Supreme Court to decide was whether uh, the um, appointments that were made to the, to the board of the Central Bank of, Bank of Venezuela by Mr. Guaido, Juan Guaido, who is one of the two claimants, or was one of the two claimants as head of government of Venezuela, uh, were valid and could have been enforced by the court of the United Kingdom. And I suppose the whole point was to decide whether the UK court could stand in judgment over the act of a foreign sovereign state that was performed on the territory of that foreign state. Now, the, the decision was very bewildering to me because uh, in the very first uh, paragraphs of the speech of the, of the majority, uh, Lloyd-Jones stated something on the lines of there, are, there is no agreement uh, about the discrete, the discrete principles that comprise the Foreign Act of State Doctrine. But it was only four years before, in 2017, that the UK Supreme Court had handed down a judgment restating comprehensively the Foreign Act of State doctrine and trying to put order in what up to that moment had been a very messy field. So the fact that only four years later there was a, a, another Supreme Court judgment that said the, that conveyed the idea that the field is still in a mess made me want to look into that particular question. And I suppose that what came out of it was an article uh, that tries to reframe the foreign NATO state doctrine, try to streamline what now is seen as a doctrine made of three different rules into one rule only, and does so by borrowing an analytical framework from legal philosophy, which has mostly been used in, in, context, in the context of criminal law, but that basically tries to distinguish the constitutive elements of a rule from the rule from the elements that situate themselves outside that rule and instead restrict that scope the scope of that rule by uh, being exceptions to it and I suppose that by thinking around this uh, particular distinction I made an argument concerning how one can try and streamline the foreign act of state doctrine into one rule really in order to bring some hopefully clarity, but also some simplicity to what at the moment I think it's a bit of, a, of an overcomplicated area of English law. So this is one thing. The other article that is forthcoming and eventually uh, will uh, feed into a monograph that I'm working on at the moment on customer international law concerns the approach of international courts and tribunals to choosing evidence of state practice and opinion juris in the context of customer international law identification. Why is that relevant? Because according to two element theory of customer international law, in order to have a rule of customer international law, we need two ingredients. One of them is the conduct of states, and the other one is the state's conviction that that particular conduct is required as a matter of international law. So in order to decide if a particular rule or custom exists, international courts and tribunals look into the evidence of these two elements, of these two ingredients. And the problem is that one would expect 
that international courts and tribunals con would conduct extensive reviews of evidence of state practice and extensive reviews of evidence of opinion juris. But that is not the case, not at all. And international law scholars have known this for decades, so I'm not saying anything new in that particular respect. But I suppose that the point of the work in question that I'm, that I'm uh, speaking about now is more to do with the methodology uh, that the work um, is being done with. So far, scholars of custom have tended to look at custom international law from the point of view of doctrinal legal research. What I've proposed to do instead is sli something slightly more empirical, which was to look at the decisions of a number of international courts and tribunals that used inductive reasoning to decide uh, whether a particular rule of custom existed or not, so to identify custom. And by inductive reasoning, I mean relying on evidence of state practice and opinion juris. And try to categorize that evidence by type. So what kind of evidence have exactly these courts and tribunals looked into? Was it, for example, uh, a resolution of the General Assembly of the United Nations as evidence of opinion juris? Or was it conduct in connection with the implementation of a treaty in the context of state practice? And then I'm also looking at the states from which that particular evidence originates. So which state was the one that conducted itself in a particular way? Was it China? Was it Portugal? Was it Zambia? And through that basically I've been trying to put some numbers in a way to what so far has been a solid, correct, I think, doctrinal argument. So suppose that the added value of the paper is exactly this empirical work, this, this groundwork, that confirms what we, ha what we, what we already knew but the thing is, nobody else had done it before. Suppose that when starting a promising academic pro proposal, you need to have a feasible original idea. Originality has to be taken with a pinch of salt because as I said earlier on we have exhausted the problems to write about at least in my field in international law so we have in a way uh, new ways of looking at old issues and that is the originality probably probably I would say okay. and the feasibility sorry the feasibility is that it needs to be something that you can complete in the time that you have in front of you if it's a one-year project, it needs to be something feasible in a year. If it's a three-year project, you have a lot more scope. So that's it, just the adjustment to be done. But individual research in legal research is very prevalent, I would say. It's primarily what we do. We, we work as individuals. But I think that working as individuals would be very boring, first of all, and isolating. And also it would take away the fact that really what we're doing when we try to come up with a legal argument is try to convince others that what we're saying makes sense to some extent. So suppose that having someone that is willing to engage with you as you're working on a project that is not yet completed, so that collaborative element to research, is extremely valuable to make the argument that you are running more interesting to others perhaps because you have maybe missed something that others may be interested in seeing in your argument, uh, but also more convincing honestly. I mean there may be some shortcomings of the argument that you haven't thought about or that you haven't really addressed head-on that others instead encourage you to look into and, and to address in the subsequent iterations of, of the paper or of the, of the article, that you're, the, the monograph for that matter, that you're working on. So it, I believe that it is extremely important to have the collaborative element in the context of, of research. One other thing that I would say is that the collaborative element comes out when one goes to work in progress seminars, for example. And that is extremely valuable because those are fora in which someone can really present something which is not yet there and you're still thinking about it and uh, everyone else is there exactly to try and help you out, finalize what you're doing. There is no ill will. It's not like going to a conference when people sometimes don't really like one another. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a very positive 
experience to have and something that, especially as junior scholars, I think we should do as much as we can of. Advice on publication is, well, two pieces of advice, I suppose. And again, to the extent that I can give advice because I'm relatively junior myself. <laughs> so I would say that there is something such as overpublishing. Two, maximum three pieces in good journals a year is already a lot. I would say two probably is the ideal number that a scholar should be aspiring to. More than that, and I very much am afraid that the quality of what one is producing goes down drastically. That is my personal view, of course. And the second piece of advice would be in terms of selecting the journals to which to publish, well, to which to submit pieces to publish. And this is something that I was passed on by my research supervisors and mentors before me. The idea is very simple. If a piece is not out in what are usually regarded as the best journals in the field, then it's not supposed to be out at all. It's, uh, it's better to keep it there and to think about it for a few more months, or even not publish it at all, and maybe have it go into a monograph you're working on, perhaps. Or maybe have it go into a collection of essays that you're invited to write, rather than have it out in a journal that maybe does not have as much visibility and that does not, in, it does, that does not attract people to read your work. LLB dissertation supervisor used to be a judge on the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. I remember that I went to see him when uh, I wanted to write a dissertation for uh, when I was a student in Milan and I told him that I wanted to write on the recognition of foreign arbitral awards in Italy in commercial arbitration. So a pretty hard private international law question and I remember that he looked at me from across his desk and he said have you ever thought about public international law instead? And I said, sure, I mean, I, I'm perfectly open to the possibility of it. And he basically suggested that I look into the dispute resolution mechanism of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, and especially into the question of questions relating to provisional measures, which has been a topic that has undergone a number of developments in the last few years, which made it interesting at the time, of course. So that's how I began uh, looking into the law of the sea. But that was a topic that was very much at the intersection between dispute settlement and the law of the sea. So suppose that if I really had to, um, to be honest about it, my interests in dispute settlement and the law of the sea, they started very much at the same time. And the funny thing is that I'm still researching and publishing in provisional measures and in uncle dispute settlement today, uh, more than 10 years on. So it's funny, I, I don't really think it makes sense to speak of preferences in terms of research methodologies because it doesn't really depend on what you prefer. It depends on the questions that you ask. Because th to answer certain questions, you may have to use certain particular methodologies. So for example, the piece that I spoke earlier on about in relation to the selection of evidence of state practice in opinio juris, the sort of question that I was asking which was how do international courts and tribunals really do it, had to be addressed by empirical means. I don't think there was any other way of doing so. So that is why I went down the empirical legal studies rabbit hole, so to speak. Otherwise, I could have just done a, a doctrinal piece, but I would have added absolutely nothing to what others have said before me. So I don't think it was worth going down that route. So more than having a preference for the methodology, I think the question is, what question are you asking and what is the methodology's best, methodology best suited to answer that question in a meaningful way?
So I was a student at the Hague Academy of International Law twice, once in 2012 in the private international law session and once in 2015 in the public international law section, session. Now only in 2015 I attended what we call the directed studies that are the sessions for advanced students, at the time I was a PhD student, uh, for advanced students that are led by a director of studies, which is exactly what I must do in the 2027 winter session. So I have a rough idea of what will happen during those sessions in the sense that I know that there will be a you know, relatively high level discussion on current topics of international law, mostly I would say related to the topic of the general course at the time. And if I'm correct, in 2027, the general course is going to be given by a Belgian scholar by the name of uh, Pierre D'Argent. So I will have to be in discussion with him, of course, and the director of studies for the other session, because I believe there is a, an English-speaking session and a French-speaking session. And I don't know which one I'm doing yet. I think the English one, but I'm not entirely sure. So we have to be in conversations with uh, Pierre D'Argent and with the other person who's going to be the other director of studies to decide how to structure those sessions. But by and large, it's going to be discussion on topics related to general course and that are very likely to be current in 2027, whatever those may be. On many weekends I come to work on a Saturday, but I do not work on Sundays. So I make it a point to take one day off, at least, during the week. When I can, I take both weekend, b both day of the weekends off, because I, d I do believe that we, we need some time away from, from work. And I believe that as academics as well, we have to let ideas sit in our mind. Just let do something else. Do not think about the topic that has been on your mind for the entire week or for the entire month, just do something else, go out with friends, go for dinner, play sports, whatever else. So uh, I very much try to take those ones off. What do I do? It very, very much depends. M mostly I try to be social during weekends, I would say. So see friends is a, is a thing that I do quite a lot, whether it is because we go out for dinner, we go for brunch, we go hiking, we go swimming anything, but anything that takes mind or the mind uh, off the research work itself and teaching for that matter as well. Oh. <laughs> it's always a bit difficult to, gi to give you my favorite author or book because there are so many that I enjoy. I suppose I can give you the ones that I am liking at the moment, probably, which are the um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez I'm quite enjoying at the moment. And I'm reading a fair bit of Jane Austen for some reason. Uh, hiking, trail running, why I like it. Because it's in the open, it's an outdoor sport, and uh, and Hong Kong actually is great at that. The, you have some very very good trails, and they are interesting. They have great views. They're well maintained. What's not to like? And you don't have to pay gym membership fees. Three films, uh, In the Mood for Love, uh, Wong Kar Wai, and then I would say I really like the 2005 version of Pride and Prejudice, the one directed by Joe Wright, and I really enjoy Casablanca, the 1942 movie. And three books, one of them is Chronicle of a Death Foretold by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, as I said. Another one um, that I really enjoyed uh, already years ago now is Memoirs of Hadrian by Marguerite Yusenar. And then the third one is uh, Deng Xiaoping and the, and the Transformation of China by Ezra Vogel.